Our scripture reading today is from the book of Ephesians, chapter 1, verses 11 through 23. In Christ we have also obtained an inheritance, having been destined according to the purpose of him who accomplishes all things according to his counsel and will, so that we who were first to set our hope in Christ might live for the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you had heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and had believed in him, were marked with the seal of the promised Holy Spirit. This is the pledge of our inheritance toward redemption as God's own people to the praise of his glory. I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints. And for this reason, I do not cease to give thanks for you as I remember you in my prayers. I pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation as you come to know him so that with the eyes of your heart enlightened, you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance among the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power for us who believe, according to the working of his great power. God put this power to work in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the age to come. And he has put all things under his feet and has made him the head over all things for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. The scripture from Ephesians is a a beautiful beginning of this letter that Paul writes uh, to the church of Ephesus. In it, he wants to outline for them who Christ is and what it is that Christ does for us. That Christ is the foundation of the church and that uh, through Christ, God has reconciled the world to him. And that we can rest secure in our salvation in who Christ is for us in our lives. And in this passage, as it begins, there are a few things that it it talks about that I think are really important for us to understand about who we are at the ground of our very life, at the the being that uh, we exist in. And uh, and in that phrase, it says that, that he's come that we might have an inheritance, that we have an inheritance as children of God. We are God's children, and uh, we have this inheritance that he provides for us, children of God, and does so, and in doing so, we have a destiny, a purpose for our lives. We know our identity, we know our grounding, and we know that there is a direction that we are headed. And those two pieces give us all we need to know about who we are. Before anything else, we are children of God. It allows us to rest secure in that place and understanding and that God has a direction, a destiny for us to go. That destiny is God's leading in our life and in our heart. It's made up of the gifts that God's given to us and the direction that God would set our course on and the way that God would um, have us fulfill all that he intended for us as we were created. Now, this Sunday is uh, also our our Stewardship Sunday, which means in the uh, life of our church, we're looking at and making our commitments of how we will support the church uh, in the next year. And in each of the bulletins, there's a commitment card. Uh, You probably would have received one in the mail as well this week. And and there'll be an opportunity at the, uh, during our last hymn, if you would like to complete one of those cards and to bring it forward as an act of worship during that hymn, to come and to leave those uh, here on the the communion rail. Uh, But... So if you're visiting with us today, know that that part of it is something that is just part of the practice of what we do as a church to help support our ministry and help practice our faithfulness and stewardship. And obviously, if you're visiting, we don't expect you to fill out a card and do all that. Uh, But 
there might be some lessons as we talk about uh, generosity and we talk about God's intent for us to give back in our lives that might be applicable for you in other ways or uh, if you choose to make this your church home to, uh, to do that through the life of this church at some point. But I think there's a lesson for all of us if we uh, choose to hear it and to find it in, in our lives this way. I think for me, uh, my giving in the life of the church, return to God, it, it comes out of one basic place, and that is of gratitude. A place of gratitude for all that God has done in my life and, and for me and my family and in the life of this church and the community that we're a part of. Uh, I'm indeed very thankful for the ways that God has blessed my life. And uh, this week I got a big reminder of, of one of those. Um, some of you may have seen on Facebook this week, uh, Thomas was in an accident. Uh, he was here uh, Wednesday. He came up. He'd, uh, he'd borrowed my truck. He'd bought a piano and was moving it into his house in Oklahoma City and using my truck for that. And so I had his Jeep, and so he brought it back Friday, uh, Wednesday to uh, switch vehicles again. And, uh, of course, while he was here, he bought a, brought a big basket of laundry and did laundry at the house while he was here. Yeah, almost all his clothes, so uh, he had them all in his Jeep and heading back to Oklahoma City. And just a, a little before 9 o'clock, we'd finished our class here at the, at the church, and Angie and I had locked up and just gotten into the house at home. And he calls and he said, uh, Dad, I was in an accident, and it was pretty, pretty serious. And, um, and so, but he's, he's okay. Uh, it, but what happened, a young woman um, driving behind him on the turnpike, he, was, he said he was going 65 or 70, but uh, she must have had her cruise control on, obviously going much faster, rear-ended him uh, on the turnpike, rolled his vehicle, vehicle and because uh, and, I'd just put a full tank of gas in it for him, you know, uh, had plenty of fuel for the fire that developed, and it burned the, the whole vehicle. Uh, the young woman was okay. He was pretty much okay, just some minor bumps and bruises. But, but it reminds you of just how many things in our life we have to be grateful for. Uh, things that um, God's providence, God's care in our lives. Um, you know, we try to do the right thing in our lives. And, and I think for the most part, when we follow the right course in life, God recognizes that and God rewards it. Um, and, and, and I, I see, you know, his surviving that crash maybe as a part of that. You know, when you're, you're doing the right thing, you're living life in a way that follows uh, God's direction, hopefully God's blessing uh, rests upon us and gives us a sense of security. But we know it doesn't always work that way, right? I mean, that's why we have the book of Job. It reminds us that even sometimes when you do the right thing throughout life, uh, sometimes suffering just comes. And, uh, and there's tragedy in our lives. And, and, and it just is, it, it, life doesn't always work out the way it should in that regard. But, um, but I, you know, I see in that some of God's care and a lot to be truly grateful for. And, you know, the odd thing is, as we were closing up this class, we'd finished up the uh, several weeks we'd been teaching on um, uh, leaving a legacy uh, in your family. And, um, and I, I just, you know, talked about the things that I was most grateful for in life were, you know, for my family, for their health, for their security, for their doing things that they found meaningful and important in their lives. And, uh, and during all of that, you know, there was this hand of God's provision and care for him. He had to make sure that uh, he had the last say of that, I think, um, you know, that he survived. And so, I mean, just instinctively, he just climbed up on there. And so, of course, I had to take the picture. But, uh, you know, we, we survive. And God carries us through in that way. And that, that's what we're, th we're, th we're thankful for. Um, whenever you read in Paul's letter, he says uh, to the church, the church in, in, uh, in, in Ephesus, and he, he says to him, I am thankful for you for your faithfulness and for your love. 
And, um, and it's out of that sense of gratitude that he writes the letter to let them know uh, his gratitude for them and to understand the full depth of who Christ is in the life of the church and in their lives individually. Deeply thankful uh, to them. And it reminds me, not only is my gratitude and thanks to God, but it's also to you as a church. Uh, you are an incredibly loving and faithful church to be a part of, and, and it's truly a privilege to, to serve as your pastor in that way. Um, you're, you're faithful in, in listening to God's call in your life. Uh, you're, you, you're trying to live that out in your, your workday world. You're connected to ministries and programs in the life of this church that help further you in that journey and help contribute to others and further that journey for others. Uh, this church does so many things. Um, you know, just recently we've started the grief share class, and we've that goes along with uh, divorce care classes that have been taking place, and and we teach the Financial Peace University, and uh, we have Sunday school classes that people are connected to and feel such deep belonging and a part of. Uh, we are, have ministries with women and with men, uh, with the women, the something worthwhile that extends and reaches out so far beyond in this community and the UMW providing support and care and nurture for all those who are a part of it. Um, even, even the small things, just providing space in this building. You know, yesterday uh, they were preparing for the next walk to Emmaus and the team, that uh, women's team, was doing their training and they were meeting here. And yesterday morning they were worshiping in this space and I was a little grouchy this morning because I had to reset my amp and adjust everything out, you know. But then you think about the work that, it, you know, having to make those adjustments for, uh, that you help support and care for in the way that uh, this congregation does, uh, you know, it's minor stuff. It's minor to have to, you know, work those kinds of things out. Uh, a faithful and loving congregation that does so much in that way. You know, through your support of the Samaritan Fund, um, we probably, there are probably... 50 to 100 families a year that we help uh, pay the utilities for to help keep them on for another month um, whenever someone's faced with that kind of struggle. And, and, and you know, even, even people who do well know that it, sometimes when the bills come due and if things have hit us hard, it may not always be easy to do, but, but even for, for those who struggle at a much uh, more basic level, that kind of care... Um, it, it's the difference between making it and not sometimes. Uh, we do vouchers with the, uh, the food pantry here in, in Chickasha, and every Wednesday, anywhere from, oh, say, eight on a small uh, week to uh, sometimes nearly 30 families will come and get the vouchers to go immediately get uh, groceries to help care for those families' needs. Those are a part of the ministries that, that you do and that you're a part of. Not to mention what we do with our children and youth programming and how those connect to children's lives and, and uh, the support of mission around the world. Uh, there's a lot that uh, you do and we as a church should be truly thankful for. Um, you might remember this chart. You might remember it as the longest sermon of the year, probably. And uh, I, I should have, I've, I've, I've jested on that one. I, we won't spend a lot of time here. But, but that last one, you can't probably see the words, but the purple on the very bottom. Um, you know, we, we did this survey as a church which talked about our discipleship and how we're living that out in different ways. And, um, and so this one, the last one, was on generosity. And uh, the, the DNA means did not answer. And we didn't have that as a category, but 12% of the congregation when we did the survey didn't answer related to, to the, the generosity or life of stewardship. And, um, and you know, we, we thought there could be a lot of different reasons. Maybe someone felt unsure about uh, they're giving, or maybe they weren't giving, and so didn't want to, to check one. Or um, maybe, you know, sometimes um, one spouse might handle more of the finances than the other, and so they weren't sure, so they didn't want to fill it out. It could, could be something like that. But um, 
but this one particularly relates to uh, how we practice generosity through the, the life of the church. Uh, the exploring part was um, 21% of you answered that you give something whenever you're in worship. And so, um, you know, if you're here, you'll make a contribution. But if you're not, you don't, and don't think much more about it. Um, and, and that's okay. I think the thing is that God wants us to be growing in our maturity in relationship. And so, if, if maybe we're at that category, the, uh, the step is that, that we not just let it be whether we're here or we're not here, but we do it in a planned way. Maybe for us, if that's the case, we make a regular practice of making a contribution uh, every month. And we do that in a way that's budgeted and planned. We build it into our budget. You remember the video we watched, right, on God's pies? And, um, you know, the, the big chunk of it went to the house, the mortgage. We all understand that. And then the cars and other things. And then it got down to that last bit that was there for me. And then he realized he had left God out. Didn't you like the part where the guy said, dude, he brought the pie? You know, I mean, he brought the pie. There's no pie without him. And yet, he's left out. No part for him. No pie for God. Um, if we wait, the person who says, you know, after I pay all the bills, there's just not anything left to give. The person who says that's right. I mean, that's absolutely the truth. All our agendas in life will consume everything we have. And if we wait and we give out of what's left over, there's rarely much to give from. If, on the other hand, we make it a priority, and this is why Scripture teaches about what the tithe is, is that you give out of your first fruits, out of the beginning. The idea was in the harvest, when the harvest would come, that they would give the first 10% of what the harvest made to God. And if you did that, the remaining 90% was easy to live on because the first 10% went there. There's an old story, I know I've told you about it, but it's, it's too good to not tell, uh, about a church that had really struggled for years out in western Oklahoma every year to make the budget. I mean, they always had a hard time doing it. And uh, finally, they asked a guy in the church if he would be willing to, to chair the, the finance committee. And, and after a long time of saying no, he said, if you will not ask me any questions about how we do it, I'll... I'll take the job. I'll say yes. And uh, they said, well, that's easy. We got someone to say yes. So they did, and they didn't ask him any questions. But, but when they got to the end of the year, the church had overshot their budget. They had more money than they ever needed for supporting the ministry of the church. And, um, you know, they'd promised not to ask, but their interest just peaked too much for them to really, uh, you know, they just had to ask finally. They said, you know, the year's over and we've taken care of it. How, how did you do that? How did we meet the budget like that? And you say, well, you know, I, I own the grain elevator in town. And so uh, every Methodist who came and brought their harvest in, I just took the first 10% off and gave that to the church. He made them tithe, right? They didn't have a choice about it. And the truth is they didn't realize it and miss it. And the truth is that it was more than enough to provide for the life of the church. Now, it's probably a made-up story. It's a nice story. It, uh, but it gets us the, to the point of understanding that when priorities are set right and we budget and we live financially by God's way, of setting that priority first, in our lives, it becomes something easy to live out. Um, maybe not easy. It's still work. I, that, that's too, too much to say. But uh, it becomes a real joy and a blessing to us and to the life of, of the ministry of the church that way. Um, beginnings was the 27. And that, uh, there are folks who said, 27% of you said, you give on a percentage basis of what you have, and you're working toward tithing. 
Um, that's where many people are in, in, in their lives, of deciding at some point, and I don't care where you draw it, but if you decide you want to make this a discipline in your life, and remember, no disciplines are easy when you begin, as, as the Proverbs tell us, they're all hard, but they become what builds righteousness in our lives as we practice them. That the discipline of giving on a percentage basis lets us pick a place to start and to live with that, and then the next year choose a percentage to increase until we move to the place where we are tithing. Whenever Angie and I began in ministry, uh, we were not, we hadn't in all that time we were in seminary, I was in seminary, uh, we hadn't been tithing. And so it would have been difficult for us to jump from where we were to 10% immediately. But we took a couple of years, those first couple of years in ministry, to give on a percentage basis and to increase that to the, the place where we were tithing in our lives and giving 10%. Uh, that percentage, proportional giving with a growth toward, uh, toward tithing, I think is a great plan for many people. And it helps us to, to, to be faithful and to do it in a realistic way and to step into the place where we believe God's calling us to do. Those that are at the growing stage, 25% of you said you're tithing and you're trying to be faithful and asking the question about how God allows you to use the remaining 90%. Being faithful with how you live with the 90%. And that means by budgeting, by planning things well in your life and your family. It means doing those things so that uh, your, your practice of, of faithfulness, uh, it goes beyond just giving God the 10%, but that God probably cares about how we spend the rest of it. Uh, that we're faithful with it in our lives. Um, I rem remember I, Angie and I had recently gone through as we're preparing for the uh, mission trip to the Philippines. They do a training for those who are leading the teams. And, uh, and, it, and the director of volunteers and missions said one of the biggest conflicts they have in their office is whenever young people go on a mission trip and they come back so changed. I mean, they go and they see the world so differently and experience it so differently, they come back changed. He said, the way we talk about in the office is, how do you make my kid a communist, you know, in one week? I mean, it, you know, but they go and they see something so different in the world, and they come back with a, a very different perspective about how we deal with money and how we handle possessions in our lives. And they want to be so altruistic in making the world uh, the same for everybody. And, uh, you know, there, there's a little bit of shock that comes uh, with that. I remember our daughter being involved in a project, and, uh, and, and for, for several years she wouldn't go to Walmart because uh, she saw and, and practices where some of many of the things that were sold were uh, done by very minimal labor uh, employment and in terms of, of the value of employment. And so it became a question for her ethically about how she spent everything in her life. Could she buy something if it was made outside the United States because she didn't know that it was made in a way that protected the rights of workers. And so she would ask those questions over and over again. That's a part, I think, of, of God's faithfulness uh, of living with the 90 uh, that we have of, of asking the questions about that 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 sometimes might challenge us a bit uh, I'm not saying that pick up an anti Walmart agenda that's not it but uh, and, but to to ask questions about how uh, the use of the rest of, of what you have uh, it lives in faithfulness with God's vision for the world the last 16 percent were those that, uh, as it categorized as maturing. And those were uh, those of you who uh, give beyond 10%. And uh, some of that happens through a tithe to the, the church, but then finding ways to give beyond that that make a difference in the world. Sometimes it might be supporting a cause or a project that, that really is important to you. Uh, some of you, it might be supporting Marsha Alexander uh, as our missionary in the Philippines. It, 
It, it might be uh, by providing a scholarship for a kid in college that goes beyond your tithing in the church, but to help make a difference in that kid's life. Uh, a few weeks, month, well, a month or two ago, I you know, shared with ways that we can give beyond that 10%. And, and, and said, wouldn't it be a neat thing uh, to, to help pay a single mom's utilities for the year? And you know what happened? A couple of y'all put your heads together, and someone came into the church office and said, um, we would like to do that, and put in to practice a plan to help pay the utilities for a single mom for the next year. I, man, I mean, that was the coolest thing in the world to, uh, to see happen. Um, ways that you choose to be faithful beyond your 10% giving. And you're looking at the rest of what you have in life and asking, how can I use that uh, for God in the world? Um, we, we, we develop the practices. And when we put the first fruits first, we're able to do so much. It's as if when we budget our life, it's able to stretch further whenever it's planned and done in a way that, that uh, is in accordance with God's direction through Scripture. We use a card... A pledge card, an estimate giving card, you can give it a lot of different names, as a vehicle uh, to help that happen. And there are really two reasons that we do it. And, and it may not be the reason that you think. Um, some people feel like if they make a pledge, they're obligated, and then it feels like a bill that they have to pay. And that's not at all the intention. It's never what that's about. Uh, the first reason we use a pledge card is that um, it helps us to make, in, in, in growing in a discipline, it helps us to make a commitment and to, to make that commitment. And we use it in lots of different ways. Some people use a commitment as a challenge. And they set it high and they're going to work hard to get there, but they might not quite reach it. For some in the church, that's how... Uh, the pledge card works is that it allows them to make a commitment to remind themselves of to hold themselves accountable to and to use that as a practice to reach their highest ability to set that goal and to, to work toward that on average more pledges are overpaid than underpaid uh, we you know we'll take what's pledged in the life of the church and when we get to the end of it it's almost always over a hundred percent and that's because some use it as a challenge to grow, too. Some use it just as a basic budgeting tool. And so you know you put it in there, it's going to be there, and you take care of that every month or every week, however you choose to do your giving. And, and you just meet that. Others, um, you know, in Oklahoma, there are a lot of uh, ways that we earn our livelihood that are volatile. Um, if you're a farmer, you don't know what, I mean, it's an act of faith to plant the crop. Uh, if you're in the cattle business, you don't know what the value of cattle will be when it comes time to sell. And, um, and so for many, the, the reason they use the pledge card is to make what they see as their minimum commitment. And if, if, it's, if it's a rough year, this is what our giving will be. But if it turns out to be a good year, then it will be beyond that. And that becomes an opportunity for them to grow in their giving beyond what they saw their, uh, their commitment to be. And that often is the case. I think it's probably why uh, we tend to overpay on the pledges uh, rather than be on the, the lower side of, of that. But God's faithfulness allows us to use this tool that way. The other thing it lets the, is the finance committee to have a basic idea of what we think we'll receive over the course of the year and to budget appropriately in that way. And as we grow in our faithfulness and our management of what God gives us, God will increase what we have to manage. It's kind of a natural principle of how it works. When we are faithful to God in our practice, of, of living as good stewards, managing what God gives us, God will increase what we have in our ability to give. Now, in the uh, Jewish tradition, there's a part of the Friday evening uh, gathering that's called the Hagdalah service. And the service, 
uh, is a time where the family gathers for worship, the community gathers for worship, and they remember that God is the one who has provided all that we have in life. And one of the symbols that they use is that uh, a simple chalice is, is placed out onto the table with a saucer underneath it. And they remember that the, the chalice symbolizes our lives and our family and the needs of our lives. And they remember that everything that goes into the chalice comes from God. God is the one who has given us everything that we have in life. And so they pour it. And they pour it until it's full because God provides richly for us. And then they keep pouring because God overflows what God gives to us in our lives. And that which overflows the needs of our life then comes to represent how God has blessed us to bless the world. That God cares for our need. God fills the cup of what our basic need and provision is in life. And then God enables us to give to the world beyond and to help make a difference, to help reach out in service to transform the world. In the church, we do that on behalf of, of Jesus Christ to make a difference for him and for his kingdom that other people's lives are made full. The overflow is the overflow of blessing that God places into our lives and allows us to give beyond in that way. Um, there are a lot of reasons we approach giving in our lives, but the most deepest is out of a heart of gratitude. And so, if you're prepared to do so this week, uh, well, at the close of the service, during the last hymn, we'll invite you to come up and uh, make your commitment and to leave your pledge card here. If it's something you still need some more time to think about, do that, absolutely. You can bring it into the church. You can call it into the church. You can mail it, all those kinds of things. There are plenty of ways to get it done. Uh, someone did ask me about uh, if you do your giving online, and we have a growing number of people who choose to do that. If you, if you change your pledge card, will that automatically change your online giving? We can't affect what you choose to do out of your bank account. So, you know, we, you know if you send a, a, a pledge card in, uh, that will let us know your intent, but you'll still need to go online and to change that to reflect what you uh, choose to do. Uh, I mean, we, can't, we don't have, you know, much as we might like to, we don't have control of your bank accounts that way. Uh, so when, but if you just go on to our, our webpage at uh, epworth.info, and then there's a big green button to donate now. You can click that, and you can make a one-time contribution, or you can set up a weekly contribution or monthly, however you choose to do it. Angie and I do it online, and we do it twice a month so that it comes out of our uh, bank account. You can use a variety of ways to do it, uh, but that becomes a real simple practice for us. It uh, takes a lot of the uh, thinking about it. it, just makes it a regular part of, of happening for us. Um, in this year, uh, you've made a big difference in the life of the church through your giving. One of the things that uh, last weekend, a group of us from the church were talking about uh, financial giving and generosity, and I realized that I tend to approach giving out of my own need to do it, that God has created us so that we have a need to give back in return. And so I tend to think about it that way. Some people, we tend to want to see how our gifts are making a difference. And, and so I, because I approach it the other way, I tend to neglect that side of it. So one of the commitments that, that we've made to you is that over the course of the next year, we're going to uh, highlight ways that your giving through the life of the church makes a difference, both in our mission around the world and through local programming that takes place here, uh, so that you can see how uh, you're being a part of God's kingdom lived out here uh, in this community. Amen.